So we were talking about Habakkuk forever ago. I believe it was uh, three weeks ago. Um, does anybody remember what the book is about? Um, Habakkuk is complaining to God basically because of the way that people are acting. And God says, don't worry, I'm going to send your enemies to correct them. And then he's like, why would you do that? <laughs> okay. How many um, times does God answer the prophet? I think it's three times. I think it's three times. Maybe just twice. It's twice. Why do you guys think three times? Because three is an important number in the Bible. <laughs> It's a seven. Okay, and approximately when was the book written, or the historical situation that called for the book to be written? 680. You guys remember? Uh, Isaiah was pretty darn close. No, I, no, yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah, uh, it was in the 600, 600s, um, b uh, as the Syrian Empire was being destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. He said 80. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Did yeah. you really? I was yeah. Man, oh man. <laughs> yeah, he said 80. You should have left out the AD there, but I already marked it down, and it's going to be impossible to unmark that, so yeah. you got the point now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess seven points. <laughs> got out of six one. <laughs> yeah. Can't believe we let him get rid of that six. Golly. <sighs> okay. So there's just a few verses before we get into this that I wanted to look at before we get going on to um, pushing ahead. The first one um, is actually quoted, I believe, three or four other times in the Bible. And it says in Habakkuk 2.4, that the uh, that the righteous people will live by faith, and so there's a few things that are kind of important to notice. And I brought up a few of these a couple weeks ago. Um, the first off is uh, for God to say the righteous person will live by faith. In a way, He's warning the prophet because He's saying, you know. You're, you, you're here, you don't see what I'm doing, and you're complaining about what I'm doing, but let me just kind of, you know, you can either complain or you can trust me, you know, and, and the, you can kind of see what he's talking about there, and I don't want to get too off track here, but, um, and then, but it's also kind of an encouragement for the prophet, too, like, hey, live by faith, not by what you're seeing, um, and another uh, part about that, though, um, is it's just a general principle for God's people to follow, that we as Christians are called to live by faith. You know, um, it's something where we're oftentimes in situations that are uncomfortable, like Zach and Ben currently are. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it's in those times that, that our faith really does grow. Um, also, the, for God to say the righteous person will live by their faith is a reminder for God's people to face the trouble, their troubles with faith. You don't run from your problems. You don't pretend like they don't exist. You know, you don't, um, you know, turn to other things when you're going through the problems. Excuse me. We, you should always uh, turn to God with it. Um, but then another point of this is that pride is really at odds with faith, because it, at the end of the day, if, if you look at what he's saying here, it says, and "Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith." So you have to ask yourself, what do these two things have in common? Well. The idea here is that it's either my power or God's power. The prideful person puts their faith in themselves. The righteous person puts their faith in God. Um, do, do I have a need or do I not have a need? If I have a need of God, then I will seek him. If I don't need God, then I won't seek him. See? Um, and then the second... Uh, I, I, my my sister-in-law makes fun of the way I say second. So, second... Uh, verse I wanted to point out that we kind of just skimmed over is in uh, chapter 1 verse 12 and it says 
Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. And that just always caught me off guard because it's like, what do you mean we will not die? Because A, you are going to die from old age, and then B, a lot of the people in Jerusalem did die when Babylon, Babylon came in. So what does he mean, we will not die? And uh, it, it's more of the idea of um, we will not be destroyed or we will not uh, perish. The idea is that even in our punishment that God still um, has a plan for us and, and, and even when when we face physical death, you know, we do have to remember that that's not the end of how things look. So obviously some would die but the idea is we will not die. God, God won't forget his promises to us, Israel, at that, at that point. Um, even in the midst of his punishment, he will still remember Israel. Um, so the idea here is punishment, not complete destruction. Okay, so now, before we get into Habakkuk chapter uh, 2, uh, verses 15 or somewhere in there, on to 20, um, just a few a few things I want to want to look at. First off... What does it mean to walk by faith to you? Give an example. <laughs> what does it mean to live by faith? example okay. um, because I've been struggling for so long for um, them being here so we can all be together and it just seems like there's all these um, all these obstacles that it's like it, it will never happen a and I think it's just me having holding on to that faith it's what keeps me going that well it's either they'll be here or they won't it, it, we're still a family so um, I got to a point where I realized that what if God doesn't want them here he wants them there for a different reason so I kind of like go by faith like whatever God wants them to be that's where it's going to be okay. can you elaborate a little more on what you mean by um I'm holding on to that faith that I know one day we will be together. Okay. That's exactly I mean, it's what it's not mean. today, it might not be ten years from now, but I know one day it will be. I got you. Okay, that's actually what I was gonna ask, so I didn't have to think of a way to word it. Okay, anybody else? I'm still thinking of my Remember, your answers will be graded and judged communally, <laughs> and the bad answers will be public will be publicly posted on Facebook, oh, and nice. we will all mock you. Very nice. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you got some? Yeah. Um, I guess to walk by faith is to have uh, to continuously put your I guess trust in the same thing. Continuously put your trust in God, um, no matter what the circumstances are. Now, when you say trust, can you kind of just elaborate on that? Yeah. What, what What would you describe as trust? I know what it is. I just it's words. Um, just to know that that everything is going to be everything's going to be okay, even though it might. Something might seem like it's the end of the world or whatever. It's, so you're it's, more talking about, um, excuse me, uh, trust as um, uh, kind of like an um, emotional? Not just emotional, but like in every aspect, whether it's physical, whether I'm going through a physical trial or like a, a spiritual or emotional trial, it's, it's just, I guess... The whole God is in the God is in control kind of thing, mm -hmm. and I guess I'm trying to think. Oh, well, that's okay. Do you want me to give you some yeah. time and come back, or no? I guess walking by faith is living, living as if 
living with the belief that God is in control of everything and, and not really being afraid because of that, but having courage because you know that he's in control of Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I think that's. I think. I think that very much so uh, applies to the book of Habakkuk. You know, all these disastrous things on a on a on a, na on a national scale. You know, right. and uh, just knowing that God is in control. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anybody else? You looked like you were doing something there. No. Yeah, just kind of like what I've been going through with my foot. Mm -hmm. like I know eventually that yes, they're gonna they're amputate gonna it. it. <laughs> wow. I couldn't resist. <laughs> but also that God could be using this for my good. Mm -hmm. And I just have to, you know, have faith that, you know, he is, he's got this. And if this is something where I have to look for the rest of my life, that's fine too. Uh, and then the follow-up, kind of, I guess you could say follow-up if you want to, whatever. In your unfair life situations, how can you walk by faith? What, what would be a practical way, besides, you know, just the ideas of it, what would be a practical way of how you could actually walk by faith? I think knowing the Bible really helps. Okay. Because if you know the Bible, you know God's character, and you know how, um, what his... Uh, true plans are for us, mm -hmm. and so if you know if you know that, then you're able to have more faith in knowing that God has a plan for every situation, and um, you you can walk more by faith by um, praying the different um, scriptures that you read and and thinking about the different scriptures that confirm what God wants in your life, and um, and instead of worrying about the situation. Okay, that's good. Any else? What what is a practical way you could walk by faith? Just a, a kind of inaction kind of thing. You should make a claim. <laughs> don't 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 say that on the recording. People might believe you. What did you say? <laughs> Name it and claim it. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll have to edit that out. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know how to edit. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah, what were you gonna say? Um. Yeah. I stole his <laughs> <laughs> No, um, um, to make a mental, a mental note, I guess, not to doubt God when things are... And, and how, I mean, how do you do that? Like, let's say, for instance, okay, that was this morning, though, like, then you get this terrible news, and, like, how do you remember that you made that mental note, like... Well, I mean, you just, you know, if you, if you... Here, if you're going through something scary, or you you hear, you know, something on the news that scares you, you just you shut out any thought of fear, and you, I guess you you just say inwardly like, I'm just gonna trust God through this. And not, okay. I'm not gonna be afraid. Pretty much. Okay, I got you. Uh, it kind of tiptoeing, not tiptoeing, uh, the on the edge. What? Touching yeah, kind of building on it, I guess. I don't know, whatever. Uh, I can't think of the word that I'm thinking of, but... Anyways, um, I know that's something I've had to do multiple times with, with stuff in the news. Where, where it's, it's, it's honestly like the, the, the people on TV try to scare us. I mean, I don't know if it's just me because I'm so anxious all the time, but it, it's, it's very much so like they're trying to scare us with stuff. I mean, you know, if it's not this thing, it's another thing. You know, global warming is going to kill us all. Oh, Trump's going to kill us all. You know, and they, they, they give us thing after thing to be afraid of, and it's like I think that they're trying to make us afraid. I don't know what their end game is with that, though, but maybe it's because – News that makes you afraid sells better than other news. I, I don't know. But whatever it is, and, and so I actually have to do that same thing. Whenever, you know, they bring something up, and ah, then I have to remind myself what the, what the Bible says, you know. Do not, do not fear, you know. Well, no, no, not, I mean, that, that, yes, but I mean what the Bible, how, what the Bible has to say about that thing. Uh, like, for instance, with global warming, um, the Bible 
it doesn't say that things won't will be the exact same every single year, but it does say that God is in control. It does say that the earth will continue in its in its cycles until the end. It does say that. It says a lot of things like that that you know kind of give me comfort about that. So the specific thing I look for a verse that uh, yeah addresses that specific thing. Um, but I really like what Gracie said too about uh, knowing the Bible because um, you know, I mean if you're reading the Bible you'd be surprised how many times. You read the Bible and it just just so happens that you know it directly addresses what you're looking at. It's like so glad I didn't skip the so glad I didn't skip the Bible. You know, <laughs> like I say, you know, I'm just joking. I'm joking. 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 <laughs> just joking. Okay, so uh, we stopped three weeks ago in Habakkuk two, where God starts talking to Habakkuk again, but we. <laughs> Up to verse 15, and this is – that's so cute, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is um, – I think it's 15. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 6, verse 6. I'm sorry. I don't know why I keep saying verse 15. We stopped in verse – at the end of verse 5, so we're in verse 6, um, and this is what's called the five woes uh, because it's, it's five different sections of basically woe on Babylon because of this thing or that thing, okay? So uh, the first thing is – my phone's telling me I need to go ahead and end yams, so we better make some motion here. Well, let's just read through it first. Um, I will, uh, will not all of these take up a taunt song against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his, for how long, and makes himself rich with loans? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly, and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them. Because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the peoples will loot you. Because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. That's the first woe. Here, verse 9 is the second woe. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples. So you are sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall, and, will, and the rafter will answer from the framework. So the first two woes, the first one can be summarized, taking what's not yours. The second woe can be summarized, prospering by evil means. Okay. Then verse 12 is the third woe. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the, cover the sea. So that one can be summarized lacking morality. Okay. We already looked at that in chapter one, where he says that you know they are basically um, they are they are they are their final uh, authority. Uh, verse fifteen: Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon you. Uh, I'm sorry, upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will uh, will overwhelm you, and the devastation of its beasts, by which you terrified them, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants. So take advantage of others. And then the last woe. What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it, or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, to mute stone, arise, and, what it, and that is your teacher? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And with that, we have the ending of God's uh, uh, second answer to Habakkuk. And the rest of the book is, is a song uh, written by Habakkuk. So the fifth woe can be summarized, worshiping other gods. Or not living by faith. Um, that's kind of important that he ends like that because he started that off in verse uh, 4 at the very beginning before he started the woes with saying the righteous will live by faith. And then he ended it with showing showing how the, how the Babylonians were not living by faith. They were, they were living by their own pride and by their own false idols. That's like the exact opposite of living by faith. And then the other thing um, is if you look at the um, how it's um, – the format of verses six through eight uh, is the same as verses eight through twenty. I'm sorry, eighteen through twenty. Um, it doesn't start with the woe, but the woe is in the middle. 
Um, for instance, in verse 6 it says, Will not all these take up a taunt sign against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. Then in 18 it is the exact same thing. Where a prophet is idle when its maker has carved it, or an image a teacher of falsehood, for its maker trusts in his own handiwork. Da -da -da. Verse 19, Woe to him who says to a piece of wood. Whereas in all the other woes, the woe is in the first line of that paragraph. Um, it's not really an important thing. I just wanted – it's just how, how the format is. That I wasn't going to elaborate any more than that. So if you were expecting some great, you know, reveal, that there was none. Um, <laughs> so uh, not living by faith it is walking in sin, and as you walk in sin, it, it builds pride. Um, but every day is a chance to practice faith or pride. As a general rule, that's the way it goes. Every day, every 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 situation that comes up is an opportunity opportunity for us to either walk by faith or to walk in pride. Either we're going to go to God with our problems, or we're going to go to ourselves with our problems. You, you can't do both. You're, you're either going to seek after God with your with your day, or you're going to just do whatever the heck you want on your day. I mean, you guys are adults. You know this. Um, and then the next thing, uh, it's. I did want to bring up this. It, it is quite possible that, that the three chapters of Habakkuk, chapter 1, 2, and 3, that they took a long time to be written. You shouldn't go to this book and just assume that it was all written within a week. It could have been written, written in a week, but it's also fully possible that Habakkuk asked, waited a long time for an answer, and kept asking. Mm -hmm. And then the God gave him an answer, and then he just kind of sat and thought. Now, I kind of don't think that, that Habakkuk's second um, question is too far removed from God's first answer. Because, I mean, just look at, look at, look at what, he sa what he says. It's almost like sheer panic. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them. And so he's like trying to make peace with this, and then he gets down and he says, Why have you made men like the fish of the sea? And he goes to this big complaint, and it, it kind of makes me think that that's not real long after God had given an answer. Maybe like, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> and uh, anyways, um, but also if you look at the punishment that the Chaldeans would endure, it was... The, the, their punishment matches the harm that they did on others. Okay, so for instance, in verse 6, he says, um, or the first, first woe is, uh, where is it? Woe to him who increases what is not his for how long and makes himself rich with loins. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly against you? See, you have you have taken what's not yours. Now people will take what is yours. See what I mean? Um, and all the different woes, the punishment, um, mirrors what they did to others and you can read through that yourself so i don't really want to waste too much time um in verses six through eight it says will not all these take up a taunt song against him even mockery and insinuations against him and say woe to him who increases what is not his for how long and makes himself rich with loans will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect from you awaken indeed you will become plunder for them because you have looted many nations all the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. So uh, there's a few things that are really important. First off, Habakkuk prophesied that Babylon would fall quickly. And there's no proof that Jeremiah had anything to do with this prophecy. So we have two different prophets prophesying something very similar, not at the same time, and apparently without influencing each other. Too much. I mean, obviously... Jeremiah probably knew about Habakkuk's prophecy, but he came to other conclusions that Habakkuk never said. And Habakkuk's prophecy was vague enough that Jeremiah could have thought he was talking about something else if he was just making up his prophecy. Um, but another thing to point out about these verses is that it says that their loans will be called, which implies that it was never really theirs. In other words... God is allowing Babylon a temporary, to temporarily um, uh, have victory, but it's not theirs. Now, see, this is very important because Babylon just kind of acted like they owned everything. They thought that they were, man, they we're up here, guys. And uh, it even, gets even more interesting if you know the history of Babylon as a city. It was kind of seen as like a really religious city, you know, kind of like a hot spot, you know. In fact, Assyria had destroyed it. And uh, the the people got so upset because Babylon was a holy city. So Assyria rebuilt it 
only to have the Chaldeans take control and overthrow them. <laughs> they literally built their own defeat. <laughs> Anyways, and then Babylon very quickly um, lost, uh, which had a lot to do with what was going on at the other side of the mountains with the um, uh, Persians and the... Uh, 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 I want to say Medes, but... I don't, yeah, I think it was the Medes. Yeah, the Medes and the Persians. Um, a long story there, but... The idea here is that they were never really in control. Um, first off, there's two ideas here. God's the one in control of all this, but then also um, Babylon's strength wasn't even their own strength. Um, the next thing, uh, back, I already mentioned that. And then the last thing, um, that God has not forgotten their, uh, forgotten their great evil. So then verses 9-11, through 11, Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples, so you are sinning against yourself. So, uh, surely the stone will cry out from the wall, and the rafter will answer from the framework. So they believe themselves to be untouchable, which is really funny because the Babylonian Empire only lasted 70 years. And that's kind of funny. Um, also, to the measure they, they had been harsh to others, it would be done to them. Um, kind of, I think they call it poetic justice. Um, though they ha have plotted for a secure house against others by destroying their houses to make their own house secure, um, their own house would crumble around them as a testimony against them. So you, you gotta you got to realize what's being said here. He's not saying... You have destroyed other people's houses to build up your own, so their houses will tear you down. He didn't say that. He didn't say it would be vengeance. He said, you have torn down their houses to build up your house. Your own house is going to crumble around you as a testimony to you. The thing that you have built is not going to last, and it's going to be a testimony against you. Not those who you take advantage of will rise up against you. Those are two different things. See, we like to think this. Karma. Karma. You're going to get what's coming to you. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, those that they had taken advantage of, they weren't the ones to overthrow them. Jerusalem didn't rise up against Babylon and overthrow it. Jerusalem was still in exile. They were in exile until the Persians came up. So they had nothing to do with it. Neither did Lebanon or Syria. You know, So you have all these things going on there. Um, <clears throat> okay. And then the next part, verses 12 through 14... Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds, founds a town with violence. Is it, it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that peoples toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now here's where this woe switches gears. It clearly shows that God is the one in control and that God's the one who's going to bring about the punishment. Whereas the other ones could have been, maybe God doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with this. This clearly outlines it. Um, the punishment was from God who is using it to teach people visibly who he is. Now, listen to this again, because I missed this the first couple times I read it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Okay, that's Babylon. And founds a town with violence. They, they, they built their entire empire on violence to others. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? Is it not God who's, 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 who's running the show on all these things? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as, as the waters cover the sea. God is going to use this to teach people about him, just as just the same as he, he used it before you were there to show it. And in the in, in the future, God, God will uh, reveal his glory to the whole earth. Now, obviously, this has end times implications as well, but he's specifically talking about um, the way that Babylon's um, – how he's going to use Babylon uh, – for his own for his own benefit, basically, which I mean is true. Here we are reading about this thousands of years after the fact, and we're profiting from it, and we're able to know God more. Um, so it's a lesson for us, um, and it's, it was also a witness to those uh, who had heard before. Um, many of these prophecies, uh, this this is kind of funny, and I'm glad I wrote this down because I would have forgotten to tell you guys this. Many, uh, much of Habakkuk's prophecy um, from God in this in this chapter uh, actually references prophecies that had been given earlier against Jerusalem. Except this time, Jerusalem was substituted Chaldeans. 
you know, for instance, um, I believe it's Isaiah who talks a lot about Jerusalem, you know, with the, uh, what's wrong? Isaiah. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, where, where Jerusalem, you know, was being founded on violence and everything and all this stuff. Well, now it, he's saying something very similar, except now Jerusalem has been removed and Chaldeans have been inserted. Um, kind of an important point there. Um, Babylon uh, failed to listen to the prophecy that was given against Jerusalem and the prophecies that were given before they rose into power because Babylon believed itself to be secure and Babylon believed itself to be free from Yahweh's influence. They thought that they were their own authority and that Yahweh would have nothing to do with it. What does it matter what Yahweh prophesied? Who is this God to us? See, and so they ignored the prophecy and they went marching right through because they knew better. They knew what they were doing. Um, Especially, especially since they had conquered Yahweh's people. Hey, if, if Yahweh was really true, how come we were able to beat his people? Well, if they had listened to the prophecy, they would have known that it was because his people were not listening to him. <laughs> and, you know, here's the thing. People do something very, very similar nowadays. I have financial blessing. That means God has blessed me, and that proves that I'm in the right here. And just a few last things, and we'll finish up. Is that okay if we finish up, guys, with the five woes? I'd, I'd kind of like to. Um, okay, so then that takes us to verses 15 through 17. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrified them, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants. So there's a few things that are very, very, very important. The first is that they thought they were the ones holding the cup of wrath, that they were making their neighbors get drunk and taking advantage of them, and taking their spoils of war, revealing their nakedness. Um, you know, and they were the ones who were coming up conquering, and they were the ones who were conquering the other gods. But then look, look, what, look what God says here in verse, uh, I believe it's in 16. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you. In other words, you were never holding the cup of wrath. God was holding the cup of wrath. He gave it to them, and now it's going to come around to you. See, that's a completely different idea than Babylon had in their mind. Um, he tempor allow temporarily allowed their success. They were violent, and in fact, in another prophecy, it clearly said, um, I think it's, man, I wish I could remember which prophecy it was in. But he says basically this, because um, I can't remember who it is, I don't want to try and quote it. Uh, um, that they were more violent than God had actually told them to be. In other words, they had done more destruction than God told them to do. They went they, they outdid themselves in being evil. <laughs> let's let's put it like that. Um, so they were violent, now they will receive violence. Their glory was at the cost of others, and it will be stripped away. See how I said that? Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who make who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness, to expose them, to take their riches, to take advantage of them. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. And this devastation. Now look, look at this. The devastation of its beasts. He's even including the harm that they did to the wild animals. I mean, that's kind of a. I mean, he's really taken taken note here, uh, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. Um, Okay, so the next thing is in verses 18 through 20. Uh, what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it, or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork, when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, to a mute stone, Arise, and, and that is your teacher. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. So there's there's a lot that he's saying here, and I've just tapped a little bit of it. Um so let me just kind of put the, the main idea here. Um, now, the ancient world believed that, I, that the idol was kind of like a gateway to the god. So ancient people didn't really believe that the idol was the god. However, they believed that the idol impacted the god and that the god would manifest himself through the idol. 
and that the god could be manipulated in a way um, through what was done to the idol. In, in other words, you could offer a sacrifice to the idol and the god would receive it through his physical uh, representation, the idol. Um, also, another little off story there, uh, when other people would offer their burnt offerings to the gods, they believed that the, that the gods would actually eat um, that they were actually sustaining their gods physically. Anyways, um, okay, so the idol was the gateway to the god, but it was also equally a part of him that could be manipulated. The idol taught falsehood by the by the people giving unwarranted trust to it. See, they built, they, they made something. They created their own god. Then they built an idol. So they made an idol to their made-up god. Now, the, the idol, and notice how it says there, and I really want to emphasize this, is this, um, an image, a teacher of falsehood. How is an idol a teacher of falsehood? By this. The idol taught falsehood by the people giving unwarranted trust to it. See, they created a god, then they made an idol, then they trusted the idol when it didn't deserve the trust, and therefore it was giving them falsehood because it was giving them false hope. It was, it was obviously they had their own prophets who actually were on the payroll. Um, um, which was a very common thing for prophets back then. They had what were called uh, court prophets. Um, in fact, Israel had them too. Um, but Israel actually had two sets of court prophets. Um, they had the uh, pagan ones, and then they have, had the uh, court prophets to Yahweh. Um, it was just something... To, anyways, not important. Um, so they would not receive uh, protection by their, by their gods which would come as quite the shock to them. Um, but then, now in contrast to all this, God's temple is in heaven, rather than having just an idol that doesn't speak. And that is your teacher. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now, God's talking about two things with this whole temple situation here. The first thing is he's talking about his actual physical temple in Jerusalem, which at this time had not yet been destroyed. But then he's also talking about his heavenly temple, which um, we know from the other prophets is is one that exists somewhere in heaven. Um, so this is very important because this temple is about to be destroyed, and actually by Babylon. Um, it kind of makes it seem like, oh, maybe Habakkuk was wrong, and then God kind of gives some other answers. It's like, oh, never mind. Um, See, there was something else I wanted to say about that verse, though. So, in, in contrast to these, you know, idols, who um, obviously are, are fake, and notice with what with what uh, what's it called derision that God talks about pagan idols. I mean, every time every time that He talks about the idols, He always says this: "You worship a piece of wood." Well, they didn't really believe that the piece of wood was the God. I mean, maybe the God was, you know. But God doesn't make that distinction in any of his prophecies. He never once makes that he, he, he doesn't say, you know, hey, you, you, you know, you're worshiping this false god. The, 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 doesn't, he doesn't even say that. He never once says that. He always says this, you're worshiping a piece of wood. And it's just so amazing to me how, I mean, that was the apologetics that God offered to prove them wrong. You're, you're worshiping a piece of wood. He doesn't. He doesn't elaborate on their on their belief system. He doesn't, you know, rebuttal them point by point. He just you're worshiping a piece of wood. It just that just blows my mind. Ancient study, ancient history is so complex, and there's so much stuff that that little nuances and stuff that I mean you can completely miss just from reading the Bible itself, and then for God to just give such a simplified answer just blows me away. That there are people who spend their entire lives studying just one people group, the Babylonians, for instance, and have all these books written about, and, and God completely contradicts them in one simple statement. You're worshiping a piece of wood. That just blows my mind. Anyways, so in contrast to these idols who are who are being worshipped and, and, and who are just a piece of wood, the Lord is in his holy temple. This is kind of a clear contrast here. Um, so then that takes us to the second part of verse 20, let all the earth be silent before him. The idea here is that idols don't speak, but he is speaking. Um, so he is talking, 
but then also the implication here is I really don't have time to go too much into this because I've already taken too long on this part anyways. Um, God is also talking through his works that he's doing. Um, for instance, Babylon rising to power. I mean, it, it, there's some things in history that just don't make sense when you look at them. Um, Hitler, for instance. It doesn't make sense that Hitler lost. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, he had everything going for him. He had the perfect plan. He shouldn't have lost. But then out of nowhere, he turned on Russia, and he started fighting two fronts. Why would he have done that? It is a complete insanity. He would have won if he wouldn't have done that. Russia had his back. Everything was fine. But for whatever reason, that one mistake completely changed the course of history. This is one of those moments in history that just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that Babylon rose to power so quickly and that Assyria, a giant world power, fell in just a few short years. That doesn't make sense. But it's one of those one of those things that if you read history books, they over they over they oversimplify the whole thing, you know. But if you just oh my goodness, there's just some things that just don't make sense. And this is one of those things that you can tell that God was behind it the whole time. They thought, oh man, look how great we're rising to power. They didn't realize. God's just using you. Don't get too big for your britches there, guys. Um, so anyways, so God was talking. He was also talking to his works. Um, and the idea here is revere him. Um, not just let the earth be silent before him. It's not just, hey, listen while he's talking. It's not just saying that. It's also saying this, revere him. You know, Show him respect and honor, um, which is quite the statement because Babylon wouldn't show anybody respect or honor except for themselves. Their arrogance is so well known that, I mean, nobody would argue with the point. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, for instance, who's just, the Bible says that one time he's just waltzing out on his patio like, man, oh man, look at how great I am. And, you know, that's, that's very much so like a Babylonian's attitude. I mean, they're, they're like Texans. You know, we're the height of civilization up here. You know, the whole world bow before us, and it's like, oh my gosh. Anyways, uh, so don't let the temporary success of the wicked get to you. When you see people who are wicked prospering, don't let it get to you. Because here's the thing, their judgment is coming. But here's the thing, do you really want that for them? See, we get our feelings hurt, and oh, God, that you would strike them down. Do you actually realize what you're saying? Eternity in hell is a really long time. That's a really long time. Do you really? Are you really so petty that you want your enemies to burn in hell for all of eternity because they hurt your feelings? I mean, I genuinely hope that that's not something you actually want. You know, there. I was having myself a pity party a few years ago, about a few years ago. It was probably three years ago, and I, you know, all been out of shape, and then you know. After I was done and I was sitting there steaming and I, you know, there was nothing left to say to God because I, was, I had already said it all. So I was just sitting there irritated and, you know, then God kind of revealed a few things to me from his word. And he said, is that really what you want? And I, well, no, I guess that's not really what I wanted. How would you like it if you had to go to hell for all of eternity? Well, I don't think I'd like that. Well, maybe you should give a little more grace to people who act stupid and selfish. See what I mean? So with that being said... Um, don't ever, don't ever get jealous about wicked people prospering. It's, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, okay, we're gonna stop there. Are there any questions about this? No, we're good. Okay, next week we will be looking at chapter.